Um, welcome everyone and thank you for joining today. For our participants in Asia and Australia, good afternoon. And to those in the US, good morning. I'm Tasha Garcha, the Associate Director of Innovative Finance at IAX. I'm delighted to be moderating today's discussion on investing in and from Australia, trends and future predictions in partnership with Impact Investment Summit Asia Pacific. IX, uh, just to give you a little bit of a background on who we are, is a global organization dedicated to building a more inclusive world for women, the underserved, and the environment. And we do this by changing financial systems and creating innovative solutions. Over the past decade, our work has grown to span 46 countries and the entire social capital markets value chain, supporting enterprises and investors with our impact assessment, uh, creating acceleration and capital raise platforms, as well as innovative financial instruments. And through this ecosystem approach, we've unlocked 126 million in private capital, impacted 77 million lives, the majority of which are women, and avoided 1 million tons of carbon emissions. This is our 10th year anniversary, and we're honored to be partnering with the Impact Investment Summit Asia Pacific, who is a community of 350 global impact makers and a peak thought leadership forum for the impact investment community in the region. Come to the topic of the discussion today, Australia has an important role to play in Asia Pacific in contributing to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as investors, capacity builders, and as leaders in enabling policy. Additionally, as well as with all nations, of course, the country does have ways to go itself in achieving all the sustainable development goals. In view of these development opportunities, Australia has seen significant growth in demand for impact investing, with the market potentially reaching 32 billion Australian dollars by 2023. So there is potential to scale significantly if large institutional investors get involved, yet there continues to be a lack of financial products that are really meeting investor demands. At the same time, investors have yet to fully maximize the opportunities in investment in and from Australia, especially into Pacific and Southeast Asian markets. Several trends have emerged, a growing number of sectors offering high impact investment opportunities, increased investments with a gender lens, which is particularly exciting for organizations like IAX, and a flourishing ent entrepreneurial scene that can benefit greatly from larger capital and more innovative financial products. So today we're going to dive deeper into some of these trends and look to what the future holds for the impact investing space in Australia and for the region. Today, I have joined with me Rebecca Parkinson, Caitlin Medley, Simba Marakera, and Christy Cramp. I'll quickly introduce all of them before walking you all through the format for today's webinar. So, Rebecca Parkinson, to start with, is the Associate Director for Credit Portfolio Management at IAX. She is responsible for deploying capital raise through IAX's Women's Livelihood Bond product. Um, our Women's Livelihood Bond 2 is a $100 million innovative debt security that will soon become available to investors in three tranches. A committed and experienced impact investor herself, having spent over a decade deploying blended return seeking and philanthropic capital into mission-driven microfinance and social impact enterprises. Rebecca is an experienced practitioner in investing in debt and equity throughout the region for both scaled social impact and financial sustainability. So we're absolutely thrilled to have her on the webinar today. Caitlin Medley is the Portfolio Manager for Thematic and Impact Investing at QBE Insurance Australia. Caitlin focuses on QBE's impact investment initiative, Premiums for Good, and the growing demand for thematic and impact investment in the global portfolio. She has been instrumental in developing and managing QBE Group's investment approach to responsible investing and to support QBE globally. Caitlin also manages QBE's insurance group's delivery on its obligations in sustainability and impact from an investment perspective. We then have Simba Marakera, the Executive Director and Head of Investment Solutions at Brightlight Group. Simba has over 12 years of experience in the finance industry, including five years managing Christian Super Alternative Fixed Income and Impact Investment Portfolios. He has extensive experience in researching and carrying out due diligence on a broad range of impact investment deals across asset classes, including infrastructure real estate, private equity, and credit private debt both in developed and in developing markets. 
He is also the co-founder and the chair of the Ignition Impact, an angel investing network focused on facilitating small private equity and debt investments in SMEs and social enterprises in sub-Saharan Africa. And last but certainly not the least, we have Christy Graham, who is the Assistant Director for Development Finance at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, DFAT for short. Christy currently leads DFAT's work on private investment for development, which includes DFAT's leading efforts on impact investing, working with investors, intermediaries, governments, and other organizations in the ecosystem to grow at the scale and the impact of the impact investing market in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Christy is currently designing, implementing, and advising on a range of initiatives that blend public with private finance to achieve the sustainable development goals. She brings 12 years of experience in government, private, and NGO sectors, working in the private development, development finance, climate change, and environmental policy. Thank you all so much for being with us today. We're honored to have you and very excited to get started with the discussion. In terms of the format, we're going to start with Rebecca, who will share insights on the latest impact investing and innovative finance trends in Asia Pacific, who will be followed by Simba from Brightlight to give us a glimpse of the mindset of Australian investors, really discussing what they're looking for and what are the drivers behind Australia's impact investing market. We will then hand it over to Caitlin from QBE to talk about the role that leading impact investors can play in moving the needle in the space especially given the potential for larger institutional investors to come in. And then we'll have Christy from DFAT to talk about the unique challenges that underserved communities, particularly women in, in the region face, and what role government agencies like DFAT are playing to overcome them. We'll ask each speaker to share very briefly the key trends and predictions they see before moving into a Q&A session. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Rebecca. Many thanks, Natasha, um, and good evening to everyone, or good, good afternoon to everybody listening and to my fellow speakers. Um, as Natasha mentioned, I work in IIX's innovative finance team, heading up credit portfolio management, and I'm going to share an overview of the landscape in the Asia-Pacific region and talk about some of the interesting trends we're seeing around the region, such as in innovative finance and gender lens investing. But let me begin with where impact investing is today. As Natasha mentioned, it's IIX's 10th anniversary this year, and it's actually only 10 years since the term impact investing was coined. Back in 2008, IIX's own CEO and founder, Doreen Shanaz, took part in some of the first meetings organised by the Rockefeller Foundation post-financial crisis to determine how finance and development can be brought together to create an equitable and sustainable world. Within these 10 years, the impact investing space has mobilised over $500 billion in capital towards impact. We've established tools and approaches to define, generate, measure and monitor impact. We've changed how countries, civil society, large corporates and the financial sector tackle global challenges and galvanised the public, private and philanthropic sectors to collaborate in new ways. As we know, there's a spectrum of actors in the impact economy. And as the space matures, one of the exciting developments is that more and more actors, national governments, companies, investors and foundations, are recognising the distinct roles they can play in this impact economy. We see philanthropic organisations like the Rockefeller Foundation increasingly providing the catalytic capital needed to support development of new products. We also see government and donor agencies coming in to play new roles, such as providing critical de-risking capital in blended finance instruments, which help to bring new impact themes, such as gender lens investing, to private sector investors. For example, IOX really has to thank DFAT and USAID, who came in to support a completely new financial product we developed. The first women's livelihood bond which enabled us to jointly impact 385,000 women across Asia. These government agencies provided a 50% pari pursue guarantee on the bond, which was the fir world's first impact investing instrument to be listed on a stock exchange and quoted on Bloomberg. The guarantee is part of the reason why the bond was oversubscribed by investors, many of whom were new to the concept of a gender lens investment product that embedded women's livelihood impact into the design and measurement of the bond. 
Lastly, we also see a growth in the number of sophisticated funds with defined impact mandates, as well as an interest from financial institutions and billion dollar pension funds moving beyond ESG investing and announcing dedicated impact funds. As well as multinational companies who are looking to champion sustainable and ethical supply chains and social entrepreneurship. So these global trends are being felt here in Asia, which has seen some of the fastest growth rates in impact investing. Asia has over 5.5 million millionaires, close to 800 billionaires, and yet, as we know, over 250 million people live on less than $1.90 a day. So Asia is fertile ground for impact investing in three ways. There are thousands of social enterprises ready to absorb capital, a number of organisations are working on innovative financial products to channel capital, and many investors are seeking to make capital allocation decisions that are ethical, sustainable and impactful. As can be seen from this graph, in South and Southeast Asia alone, the impact investing market is on track to grow from $40 billion to $100 billion assets in assets under management in the next couple of years. And each market in this very dynamic region, from India to Fiji, has developed differently. IIX has had the opportunity to innovate and grow the impact investing sectors in each market for the past 10 years because of its ecosystem approach, which identifies key barriers and helps bridge gaps in markets. These roles include delivery of the award-winning accelerator program apps, operating a highly successful equity crowdfunding impact platform called Impact Partners. This um, platform connects high impact enterprises with over 1,200 global accredited investors, which represent over $12 billion in assets under management. IAX also, as we've mentioned, develops innovative financial products like the Women's Livelihood Bond One, which I mentioned earlier, and offers executive education on impact investment. So when looking at markets across the region, we see opportunities for scale in Indonesia, which is experiencing strong growth of mission-focused next-generation entrepreneurs. They've got over 300,000 social enterprises. These enterprises are solving key environmental and social challenges with new business models. And we see the venture capital ecosystem spilling over into funding social innovation and impact ventures. In the Philippines, there's a strong culture of giving already and a fast growing economy with a thriving social entrepreneurship scene and participation from a mix of NGOs, cooperatives and corporations. Pacific Island countries hold a promising future for diverse impact investing themes and opportunities in sectors such as agriculture, fisheries and ecosystem and ecotourism sorry, are, are presenting themselves. And in India, the market is seeing a rush of funds to the space with a promising new national CSR law and a rise in social innovation. The total value of impact investments in India since 2010 has been 5.2 billion US dollars, with 4.2 billion of that since 2015. And here in Singapore, Tomasek Trust has recently announced a dedicated fund for impact investing. So given these developments in the region, we're seeing several key trends emerging. Firstly, we're beginning to see exits, which is an exciting development for investors. For example, one of IIX's impact enterprises, Canara Capital, is a good illustration. Canara Capital is a provider of SME finance and offers loans from $2,000 to $20,000 in India. In 2013, IIX's Impact Partners platform assisted Canara Capital to close a Series A funding round totaling around US $1 million. We were instrumental in securing co-investors alongside two US-based foundations, and Canara has subsequently raised nearly US $40 million in follow-on equity and debt. The initial investor exited in 2015 and 2017, achieving pretty attractive internal rates of return of 28%. We're just beginning to see the first wave of equity exits and secondary market traction. And as Asia continues to mature, we see opportunities for Australian investors to participate in an Asian PAC region as equity exits become more commonplace. Another exciting trend is co-investments, with dedicated impact investors deploying capital alongside traditional investors. 
For example, in August 2017, IIX supported an impact enterprise ATEC Biodigesters through both the Axe Accelerator and the Impact Partners platform. ATEC Biodigesters is an Australian-based enterprise with operations in Cambodia and Bangladesh where it provides biodigesters to rural farming families. These biodigesters collect and treat animal manure, human, kitchen and green waste, which are then converted into biogas and organic fertilisers. ATEC Biodigesters raised $700,000 US dollars in a Series A equity round, with IIX bringing together a pretty diverse consortium of investors led by Australia's small giants, and including another private investor from Australia, a French foundation, a French utility company, and an initial a further investment round matched with €250,000 from the government of Finland. Finally, we see Asian investors demonstrating a strong appetite for new products, especially those that can articulate an attractive risk return impact profile. And I wanted to look at IIX's Women's Livelihood Bond series, which I work on, as an example. The WLB1 was the world's first gender lens impact investing instrument to be listed on a stock exchange and quoted on Bloomberg. In 2017, when IIX closed the WLB1, which was a four-year, $8 million debt security, over 60% of investors were from Asia. With this bond, monitoring of financial and impact performance of the underlying assets occurs throughout the life of the bond and regular reports are provided to investors. So based on this success, IIX is working on a second Women's Livelihood Bond Series, WLB2 we call it, this is a US $100 million debt security offering a fixed coupon and designed to empower 1 million low-income women across Asia. It will be issued in three tranches and will also be listed on the Singapore Exchange with the first tranche to be issued this September. As with the first bond, IAX is working with many partners to launch the WLB2, including USAID and DFAT again. DBS, which is, of course, the largest bank in Southeast Asia, and global law firms Sherman and & Sterling and Latham and & Watkins, amongst others. The first tranche of WLB2 directs the portfolio into high-impact enterprises across five countries. Cambodia, Indonesia, the Philippines, India and Sri Lanka in South Asia. And across three sectors, financial inclusion, access to clean energy and sustainable agriculture. The bond will contribute towards five SDGs, in particular number five, gender equality, of course, and I won't list all the others out, but there are, uh, we touch on a number of different SDGs. The WLB2 ties impact assessment to investment dollars in a really interesting way. As part of our upfront due diligence, we incorporate the voices of underserved women in assessing the impact of enterprises included in the bond. For example, we spoke to some 450 women one-on-one uh, -on -one for this first tranche of WLB2 alone to validate impact. Investors will be provided with semi-annual impact reports for transparency and accountability. And we verify that the first tranche will give a social return on investment of at least $3 per investment dollar. So we believe the WLB2 is a deep impact investment product suitable for both institutional investors and private banking clients. And given the large scale private investment we know is needed to bridge SDG funding gaps, it's exciting for us to see a strong appetite from investors for new products. So Australian investors have the great opportunity to drive sustainable growth across Asia and the Pacific through impact investing. We believe there's a role for everyone to play to ensure capital drives systemic change. And I encourage you to get involved by learning more about the Women's Livelihood Bond 2 and join us when we launch the first tranche in September. Signing up for our Impact in Partners platform as an enterprise or as an investor and joining our Equity at Scale program, which is a part of DFAT's Frontier Brokers program, which builds gender lens investing, investment and women-focused businesses across Asia. And with that, thank you all for listening and I look forward to hearing from the other speakers on the panel today.
Great, thank you, Rebecca. I completely agree with you. One of the most exciting parts of the Women's Health Hackathon is the fact that we're able to get the voices of the women beneficiaries uh, as a part of the solution. Uh, I, I'm baffled by the number of solutions we see in this space, uh, which are top down, with, where you're not designing an investment opportunity by talking to people who should be uh, empowered through that investment. So that's extremely exciting, and it is people like DFAT who make that possible. Um, with the first bond, with the credit enhancement support that they gave us, and with the second bond, with the funding they gave us to actually structure the first tranche. So a special thank you to, to DFAT for being a fantastic partner. Um, and it's really organizations like this that make it possible for us to sell the bond to private sector investors and give them the comfort to participate um, in, a, in a bond that, that is attractive from a risk return and impact perspective. So that's a great segue to, to asking Caitlin to speak a little bit about QBE and telling us a little bit more about where QBE is looking, um, maybe where the next impact investment opportunities in the region are, and throwing light on what it takes to bring in some more traditional and institutional investors into this very high impact space. So with that, Caitlin, over to you. Thanks, Natasha. Um, yes, look, thanks very much for the opportunity opportunity to um, share some of what QBE is doing. Um, to provide some context, um, QBE is an institutional investor um, and asset owner, and we have an impact investing initiative, Premiums for Good. We're investing across our global portfolio, and that includes in Australia and in Asia Pacific. Um, we are an insurance company. We're listed on the ASX and headquartered in Sydney with operations in more than 25 countries. Um, and we're seeking impact within our existing investment approach. And the aim there that we can um, demonstrate the positive impact can be achieved at scale and sustainably with returns that are non-concessionary. So QBE has uh, approximately uh, US 23 billion in assets under management. And the premiums for good pool um, of investments is now at 32 investments with a value of circa uh, US 440 million as at the end of last year. It includes multiple asset classes and impact areas and, um, and there's a range of depth of impact. Um, as you can see from the, the slide, um, Premiums for Good is a customer focused initiative and it's mobilized capital um, towards impact by allowing our clients to direct up to 25% of their insurance premiums, which would be invested in any case into impact investments. And so it creates an opportunity for customers to connect their insurance spend with impact. Um, so premiums for good as a model um, is, is one example of how an asset owner, um, an institutional investor is engaging with impact. And certainly what we find is that um, premiums for good is, um, and the attention to impact um, and impact investment and the journey that we've been on um, is informing um, the, the broader portfolio. Yeah, so we launched in 2000 and we launched um, Premiums for Good in 2014. Um, and as I mentioned, at the end of last year, it had grown to 440 million. Um, this year, we have set ourselves the ambition to grow our impact investments to a billion by 2021. Premiums for good, um, so the premiums for good um, investments um, are within, we're investing within our existing portfolio um, and the types of investments that we're making are social bonds, green bonds, we're investing in infrastructure, in impact private equity, um, in social property and also in social impact bonds. And we have a specific commitment in social impact bonds and in outcomes-based financing. Um, we um, have the intent to invest up to 100 million in the global portfolio um, in suitable social impact bonds. And to date, we've assessed more than 25 globally invested in more than 10. And we also seeded the first SIB fund in the US um, with working with the reinvestment fund in living cities. Um, so it's an area where um, we have an interest in deep impact um, and have innovated and, and certainly would be open um, to looking that, at that in an, in an Asia context. Current um, 
so here you can here you can see that um, the current sort of investment pool and it generally what we're looking at in terms of the types of investments by count in premiums for good. So we have 11 impact areas of which we're invested in nine and we're seeking a diversification of impact, um, including those markets and communities in which we operate. Um, we are aligned to some of our, ma you know, our major currency holdings and, our, and the QBE business. Um, and we have strong coverage in Australia and New Zealand um, and North America and Europe, given our operations and the currency holdings. Um, we also have a growing focus for Asia and the Pacific. And in the impact areas um, to date in Asia Pacific, we're investing in developed and emerging markets. And we're primarily invested in the areas of education and employment, financial inclusion, um, healthcare and sustainable energy. In addition to that, we do have an active interest in gender lens investment, both um, in terms of social inclusion, diversity and gender, and also as a cross cutting theme with all of our other existing uh, discussions. So to date, um, in terms of Asia Pacific particularly, um, we're primarily invested through um, multilateral sort of development banks, DFIs, um, given that we're, we have a very large fixed income allocation. Um, in addition to that, we're invested through private equity funds, particularly South Asia and Southeast Asia. And, um, we continue to look at new asset classes um, and we are actively looking at um, opportunities um, in the region. And I think um, it's interesting because certainly, um, you know, I think um, Rebecca's observations about sort of an interest and growing, growing interest in um, capital, allocations to, capital allocation decisions in, um, and interest in um, in Asia, Southeast Asia and South Asia um, certainly resonate um, and is true for QBE, you know, as we work towards achieving our ambition um, to grow our impact investments by a billion to 2021. Um, Asia Pacific is a really important consideration for us um, and Southeast Asia and South Asia is a really important part of that. Um, so, for us, um, premiums for good has been um, an interesting journey since we started in 2014 um, and certainly reflects the growth of um, institutional investor interest um, towards impact investments. All right, great. Um, thank you very much, Caitlin. Uh, that, was, that was extremely interesting and it's, it's wonderful for us to hear um, QB's commitment to the space. The, the Premium for Good program is fascinating. I have many questions to ask you, which I'll dive into later. Uh, and it's also a very important uh, step for other investors to see the fact that uh, someone like QBE is applying a gender lens to the investment space uh, and your investment decision making. So we'll dive into that more in the question and answer session. But um, this is also a great segue to, to bring in Simba, who has, of course, unique insights to share about the local Australian impact investment market, particularly how it's evolved and what Australian investors are looking for. So, Simba, I hand it over to you. My name is Simba Marke. I head the investment solutions team at Bright Light. Just by way of background, uh, Bright Light, uh, we were spent spin out of uh, Christian Suba, who's, who's an Australian pension fund, who basically we went into this kind of impact investment space, uh, I guess uh, before it was called impact investment uh, uh, back in 2008, as, as mentioned by Rebecca. Um, uh, but the key mission for, for Bright Light is to um, reduce the barriers uh, for institutional investors to allocate capital towards impact investing. So we um, kind of make it our mission to, to understand what, what are those barriers and to come up with solutions for poor investors. So, um, um, and um, the key part of our work in, in Australia is to uh, design customized portfolios for, for investors or create um, unique products uh, that, that meets the, the needs of institutional investors. And, and uh, in particular, uh, today, just can you share some thoughts in terms of what we are hearing from investors and what they're looking for and uh, what we think will be uh, will be important as, as we see this space grow and, and what would drive capital 
uh, in particular from Australia to um, to the world and uh, to um, uh, to Asia Pacific in particular, uh, given the the unique uh, position that Australia has. So the the first things first for for, for investors are. Uh, I guess the the saying goes that you know diversification is the only free lunch in investing, and and really when they are look, uh, when investors are looking at uh, at impact investing, they they are looking at at the diversification benefits that uh, these the kind of investments like the women's livelihood bond and others bring to to the portfolio, right? And uh, uh, you know a, a few years ago, my my colleague Tim McCready and I wrote a paper. Uh, illustrating uh, based on the put, uh, on the ten year track record of, of of Christian Super that actually impact investments played a, an important role in a diversified portfolio in in terms of having a, a, a low or negative correlation to traditional asset classes and, and therefore providing uh, stability and uh, and and uh, and, uh, and uh, diversification benefits into into uh, a, an institutional investor portfolio. So that that is very important as as um as we're thinking about what uh, what makes sense for for certain institutional investors to think to think through what how, how how that interacts with the rest of their portfolio, and the key the key piece there ends up being of course um uh, the the risk return profile, and in 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 considering the 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 return uh, uh one thing that also Put um, um, you know impact investment, especially in Asia, uh, at, at a pretty good position. Is is the need for yield? Currently, you know, um, investors are looking for yield, whether they are Australian, they are institutional investors, and or, or private wealth investors, and having um, opportunities which gives them that uh, access to to yield that's that's unique and different from what is already in their portfolio will be quite important. And in terms of risk, uh, what we find is there's obviously um, uh, a, a distinction between perceived risk and, and actual risk. And in the uh, when it comes to investing, so to impact investing, we we realize that sometimes the perceived risk uh, overwhelms the the actual risk, and and therefore investors are not um, uh, do not feel equipped to. Uh, uh, I guess understand how much risk they're taking in there, and I think that's in part part of the, where we are on the journey of impact investing. That our investors are, um, are still to understand the risk as as the market matures, and as more and more uh, investment matures, and uh, and we start to see exits coming out. Uh, as, as Rebecca mentioned, we'll see um, that the perceived risk will come. Down, but at at the moment, as as we see this perceived risk um, uh, being overblown, um, you know, collaboration with uh, with government entities like like DFAT and USAID and others in in structuring product that in a, in a sense um, uh, limits the downside for investors who allow the capital to move. And so we're very happy to see that being applied. Uh, in the likes of the um, um, uh, the level bond, um, and and we've seen that working now in our experience over the past ten years uh, uh, as well. That um, we have invested alongside um, you know government entities and GFIs, and they've uh, they've managed to uh, reduce that perceived risk and therefore allow the capital to move from commercial investors. So that's we um, uh, we are seeing the same trend here in Australia. We're seeing we're seeing openness by government entities and and philanthropic investors um, um, to pro- to play that role, and and we expect that to continue, um, especially as we look into moving capital towards uh, um, towards, towards Asia, Asia Asia Pacific, um, and the uh, and, and the other thing to to not there for for um, Australian investors is, is of course uh, there's always a issue around liquidity um, and and in, in our head um, liquidity is really um, a, a, the need for liquidity is is a, is a result of the perceived risk that uh, if people don't understand exactly 
what uh, what risk they're taking. It, it means that they they put a high premium on liquidity because they always want to get out if things get uh, to don't uh, um, don't turn out the way they expect it. So we expect again that uh, you know as, as the market matures, the need for liquidity will continue to come down. But as it is, liquidity becomes a uh, a, a, uh, a directly related to scale. And therefore, being able to structure products that are scalable, um, that in a sense can create a quasi uh, secondary market for investors where they can uh, buy and sell uh, after issuance, uh, whether it's by list, list, listing on, or on an exchange or, or just by the fact that there's a, a diverse enough uh, investor base that they can trade at, um, among each other. I think that will be important going forward. And finally, um, from from our perspective, uh, you know, impact investing is is very much a, a a personal thing, so to speak, or it's very very unique to every organization. And therefore, the the impact that um, organizations, whether they're institutional investors or um, or, or companies, um, is is unique to their culture and to their stakeholders. And therefore, being able to understand uh, the relevant impact. Um, that investors are looking for and designing products um, around that is quite important. And of course, gender lens investing, for example, is a very uh, a popular theme that we're seeing among investors um, that they're looking to invest in through that theme. And, and therefore, um, us as, as, as uh, intermediaries in the in the sector, uh, we are designing products that. Yeah. Uh, fit that needs and 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 obviously the the, the women lab would bond is, is an example of 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 a product with that theme and and we we expect to see more and more of those um, uh, as a way of uh, facilitating the movement of capital. Um, so I, those are my quick thoughts in in reflecting what uh, investors are looking for and what are things we need to see more and more of this capital moving. Uh, happy to to leave it here and and check. Um, uh, questions as, as needed. Excellent. Thank you so much, Simba. And um, absolutely, we're equally excited about all the, uh, the growing interest. Um, we will dive into that a little bit more with you in the Q&A. So that's a great segue uh, for us to invite Christy from DFA to share her insights on the specific challenges uh, that are important yet largely and a largely excluded base, which is women um, in accessing capital within the financial system. So Christy, oh, over to you. Thanks very much, Natasha. And, and as I say, it was a perfect segue to kind of move into DFAT's interest in this area. And I might start with providing a, a broad overview of our interest in impact investing, and then we can get into um, more specifics around um, gender lens investing and a range of our programs that are, are working in that area in different ways. But um, as the Australian Government Agency responsible for international development, we are responding very much to the scale of development challenges in our region and um, the relative scale of, of public and private finance. And, and that difference in scale means that we um, are very cognizant of the need to work collaboratively across the public and private sectors to make progress on these development challenges. And particularly over the last probably five years, we've be, um, been very interested in exploring different ways to use our development assistance so that it can catalyse private capital for investment in our region and for development particularly. So supporting the growth of the impact investment market is one of the ways that we're doing this. And our support for the growth in the impact investing market falls under sort of three main categories. The first is supporting organisations that um, are, are building the ecosystem, if you like, and connect market participants and bring global expertise to the region, providing market analysis and resources. So um, partnership with the Global Impact Investing Network, the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs, um, really kind of supporting that um, the, the ecosystem, the connective tissue of the market. The second one is supporting enterprises to become investment ready. And this is something that as um, a donor, we've traditionally had a lot of um, SME support programs, but what donors haven't traditionally been as good at is, is providing those programs in a way that enables those enterprises to be investment ready. Um, and so I guess our second generation of these programs, things like Pacific Rise and Scaling Frontier Incubators, is really about providing business support services in a way that then connects 
um, those enterprises with capital that meets the needs of that particular enterprise, um, enabling them to grow and scale their impact as well as commercial success. But in particular, transactions. So um, the Women's Livelihood Bond is one example of, of this. Drawing in additional investment into a particular sector or for particular outcomes in the region, um, as well as demonstrating um, the uh, an innovative financial product or bring that to market. So investing in women is another one of our, our programs that um, trying to, to demonstrate the business case for investing in women-owned SMEs. And and there, there are some other programs that um, we're working on sort of in the design phase at the moment. So expect to sort of see more in that space. In terms of gender, so gender is a core priority of all of our um, international development program. And given the importance of gender equality, not just as an important right, but a powerful driver for growth, development and stability, that, that core priority of our development program is reflected in our support for impact investing. And gender lens investing is a key thread through all our impact investing support programs. Um, access to finance for women-owned business and, and women more generally in the region is, is obviously a challenge and um, I can go into more detail on, on some of the statistics and things on that. And, and I know IAX has um, done kind of a lot of work and analysis on that as well. Um, but what I would just flag in this introductory comments is that we're also um, finding gender lens investing more broadly than that as well. And, and that's also even broader than women beneficiaries. So women beneficiaries are also really important. Um, but, but when we're thinking about gender lens um, investing, we're really looking at how we can bake gender analysis into all stages of the investment process. Um, and so a lot of the work, particularly with investing in women, has been support to our partner organisations to really look quite deeply inside their own organisational structures and decision-making frameworks and um, all stages of their investment um, process to look at um, whether that's supporting um, gender equality or look at it for gender data and um, other kind of analysis that can improve the quality of, of those processes. Um, as I mentioned, we've got a number of programs working um, in general and investing across Southeast Asia and the Pacific, investing in women, which uh, is broadly about demonstrating the business case for gender equality in business. And, and one of the components in particular is working to demonstrate the business case for investing in women-led SMEs in the Philippines, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Um, Pacific Rise, which uh, is focused in the Pacific, so Papua New Guinea, Fiji, um, Vanuatu, uh, Solomon Islands, other countries all across the Pacific. Um, to demonstrate how impact investments can be made in that region and particularly with a gender lens. DFAT Scaling Frontier Innovation is another program that has really taken an experimental approach and looked at how innovation led by social entrepreneurship can really contribute to the sustainable development goals. Um, and the three main components of that are frontier innovators, frontier incubators and frontier brokers, some of which um, you may be familiar with. Um, and I'm happy to talk in more detail about, detail about any of those components. Uh, and the Women's Livelihood Bond, which has been um, very well covered by Rebecca already. And um, as she mentioned, we're also supporting um, the second phase of Women's Livelihood Bond. So I might leave it there and um, allow a bit of time for discussion between everyone. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Chrissy. That was fantastic. And I completely agree with you. The definitions of gender lens investing um, is, is hotly debated across the space now, and, and everyone is looking at it differently. And I do, uh, we do love the way DFAT looks at it so broadly to see that how, how gender equality is really taken into the investment decision making process. And that's really key. It makes you reflect on uh, your own organization, your own processes, and, and how you come to decide what it means to, to use um, the use of proceeds of any capital you mobilize to actually truly gender equality that gives women a voice, that uses gender lens data to make investment and capital allocation uh, processes. Uh, shifting power dynamics, I think, is an important one. And I know DFAT uh, focuses a lot on, on having the right processes and systems in place to allow for that. And then most importantly, also uh, bringing men into the conversation uh, uh, gender equality um, cannot be achieved with only half the sky participating in the discussion. So that's 
that's fantastic. And I, I will hand it over to you to speak a little bit more about this uh, a bit later on. Since we're running short on time, I, I'm going to choose to stay on the topic of investing in women. It's something that uh, is, is very deeply uh, aligned with IX's mission as an organization. Everyone on this call has mentioned it, and I can see from the chats that, that seems to be uh, an, the area of most interest for most people who have logged in. So I'm just going to stay on that theme. And I'd also like to, to recognize that Australia has, of course, played a very important role in driving inclusive growth um, and achieving SDGs, including SDG 5 on gender equality in uh, the Asia Pacific region. Across the region, as you all know, underserved women are largely um, excluded from financial markets. And this makes it one of the most urgent issues uh, of the impact investment movement to tackle. Um, globally, only 4% of annual bilateral trade is really dedicated to gender equality as the primary objective. And while the gender lens movement is, is growing as an asset class, there is a lack of demand. And, and if I do say so, there is a high risk perception associated with it, which makes investors uh, need uh, different kinds of innovative products to bridge that gap between supply and demand. So for instance, you know, if you compare it to green bonds, which surpassed the 100 billion mark um, recently, Netherlands investing has seen demand of about 2 billion as of July 2018. But with folks like QBE and DFAT and, and Brightlight, um, I think we can, we can change that. Um, so maybe I'll just hand it back over to Christy, uh, just to keep the momentum going for that. And, and Christy, of course, DFAT has been a leader in promoting and developing an enabling environment for investing in gender equality across all these programs, you know, whether it's investing in women, frontier brokers, uh, Pacific Rise, which I thought was particularly brave because you're not only tackling a difficult issue, but doing it in a very difficult geography. But I would love for you to speak a little bit more about the role um, that public finance can play for innovation. Uh, and from your perspective, uh, what was it, what was innovative about the Women's Livelihood Bond, for example, that would spur more governments to do um, to push similar products into the market that can bridge the gap between supply of capital and demand for capital in the space? Yeah, sure. Very happy to talk about that. And and obviously the role of public finance in building a market is something that we think about a lot. And something that we are, are very acutely aware of when um, when supporting market development is when the market is sufficiently developed, we should be getting out and we should um, not be uh, any longer kind of interfering in, in the way markets are functioning. So it, it definitely is something that we think about a lot and think about what, what's our role in that and how what's the sustainability pathway for that market as well and, and when do we know that the market is sufficiently developed for us to, to move on to more challenging markets and more challenging issues. I think one interesting, um, when, when you say what's what's the role of a public funder and, and the same would apply to a philanthropic funder in market development, one I think is, is funding that market infrastructure that is really kind of a public good. It's particularly when a market is fairly nascent, it's difficult um, to make the case to private participants in the market that that's something that's worth funding for them. So that's something that we've um, looked at and, and doing things like supporting um, knowledge and uh, products and tools and uh, things on impact measurement and management, um, deal share type platforms, those sorts of things. Uh, I think, a clear role for public finance. The other one is um, making small um, early bets, if you like, and this, I think, applies to the, the Women's Livelihood Bond to, to, tr to encourage um, innovation in the market and, and doing that in a way that um, means that we, we can, can back organisations to, to take quite calculated risks um, across a, a whole portfolio of things that we're funding. So... The Frontier Brokers um, Initiative, I think, is a really good example of this. Um, so four organisations have been selected, and IAX is one of them, um, and all of those are trialling different ways to move cap capital towards social entrepreneurs or using a gender lens approach and all taking very different approaches. So um, Brightlight is another one, um, and Brightlight is launching the first social enterprise note series, which serves as both the needs of the entrepreneurs across the Asia Pacific, but also allows institutional investors, um, particularly Australian, to, to match the capital to the needs of the underlying entrepreneurs. And that's something that's um, 
a real challenge, particularly in the region, the, the needs of investors and matching those to the needs of the underlying enterprises. Um, IAX is, uh, and this was mentioned uh, earlier, but increasing efficiency of investment readiness and capital raising um, by looking at improving uh, gender-sensitive mentoring and corporate supply chain negotiations to really look at those power dynamics in, in those systems and support entrepreneurs um, in, in, in that process. The other two that I'll quickly mention, um, good return is incentivizing local debt providers in Cambodia and Indonesia to incorporate gender lens to loan assessment and to receive guarantee on the loan capital. So this is really about working with, with local banks um, and microfinance institutions to really unpack some of the assumptions and the um, conscious or unconscious biases that they they have when they're assessing loan application, applications, which, as we know, is, is one of the key barriers to um, financial inclusion for women in the region. Um, and the final one is is looking at, uh, with the FINA Global Alliance, looking at the market of women-focused businesses, looking for flexible debt products, so, for example, without the burden of collateral. So there's a, there's a range of different experiments, and, and the Women's Livelihood Bond, I would say, was also um, really innovative and from our perspective, was a, a product that was very early moving in terms of, of taking gender very seriously right throughout um, the design and um, and now implementation of the of the product, which was something that we hadn't seen in the market at that time. So um, I think that that has helped spur momentum for for gender lend investing across the region, and that's really. Um, it's really important for us. So that's been really exciting. Yeah, no, thank you. And we're, we're very excited to be a part of all these programs with you. We're actually very excited to have um, others like Bright Light are also participating in, in some of these programs as well. So, and and maybe that's a, that's a good segue to also invite Simba uh, to speak a little bit more. So Simba, of course, you come from years of experience in both Christian Super, who was one of the um, earliest impact investing focused pension funds in Australia, and now Brightlight, um, the recently formed sister company uh, as well. So, uh, you know, the other side of, of innovation is, of course, uh, as I mentioned, is, is risk. So, Simba, it would be great for you to um, give our listeners some insight into one of the key issues for institutional investors being um, their fiduciary duty to ensure the portfolio has appropriate risk return profile in addition to creating impact. I would love to hear from you where you see the greatest promise, um, which markets, which sectors for Australian investors uh, to invest in and in which financial and impact objectives you think are complementary. Sure, thanks for that. Um, yeah, and I guess the issue of fiduciary duties is, is front and centre for institutional investors, especially for, for for pension funds who are, you know, in, in investing kind of people's hard-earned retirement savings for to these uh, and, and from our perspective, I think we've always um, taken the view that there is a portion of the, uh, the impact investment market where you can uh, align the, the, um, the, the impact objectives with the financial objectives, especially if you're investing in businesses in, that um, are providing um, services to underserved markets, which means the more of those markets they're saving, uh, the more impact they're having, but also the, uh, the the faster their business grows. So therefore, the financial and the and, and in that sense, then you know the the, um, the, um, the impact objectives are, are very much aligned. Um, and and so we see a, a range of these kind of opportunities uh, uh, in, in in the region and in opportunities where you know the on a standalone basis the the financial metrics will not stack up for um, the um, ob financial objective of investors. This is where the collaboration between the private sector or the philanthropic capital and the commercial sector in coming up with innovative blended finance allows um, the various types of investors to take on the risk that makes sense for them uh, in a mm -hmm. blended way. Um, so, so obviously, the yeah, uh, government investors, for example, uh, um, uh, can um, you know take financial risk, but not the impact risk. For example, um, 
uh, but um, you know, commercial investors may have a high tolerance um, for for the impact risk, but uh, they're conservative about taking financial risk. So, so blending those two together can allow um, you know capital to move to really impactful opportunities while the virus investors are um, are, are taking the appropriate risk. So that's, I guess, that's the way we uh, we will look at the at the market. No, that that makes a lot of sense. And um, and and Caitlin, um, I think would also love to hear from you on, of course, QB is expecting to increase commitment to impact investing uh, through premiums for good, looking to diversify beyond um, um, established impact investment products like green bonds and even social impact bonds into new areas like gender lens investing. Um, and among the opportunities for in fixed income investments, what do you think would be required for gender lens products um, to receive the same kind of demand from Australian investors as green bonds or are other more traditional products currently receive? Thanks, Natasha. Yeah, that's it's interesting. I mean, I think in the, there is um, in the Australian um, responsible investment and impact investment um, space, I think that there is growing interest for gender lens investing. Um, and, um, and, you know, I'd, I'd certainly um, sort of reiterate Christie's sort of comments that, um, you know, that the Women's Livelihood Bond really um, was really leading in relation to, um, into this space. Um, and I think in answer to your, I think the comments that, um, also that Simba's made in relation to sort of blended finance. Um, and I think that that's certainly, um, that's certainly important, um, uh, particularly the points around sort of perceived risk um, and collaboration. So um, in terms of the sort of the growth around sort of green bonds and what, what does that mean in terms of um, gender, sort of gender lens investing, um, and the fixed income space, for example. Um, I mean, QBE was um, perhaps sort of one of the second sort of corporate issuers um, of a, a social bond, a gender, gender equality bond um, in 2017 um, a, as an issuer. Um, and is, while that is, um, I suppose, at, um, is, some, is somewhat different than uh, in, in relation to sort of overall impact is an important signal in the market um, and an important signal in the organisation and certainly um, has led to sort of uh, increased momentum and engagement and a view around sort of gender lens also um, within within premiums for good. Um, mm -hmm. So in the process of the, the signals in the market that will gradually build um, both um, uh, that will sort of, you know, that, that will sort of uh, build interest, provide um, uh, those early stage steps while um, some of the other deep impact uh, work is also being done and those products um, are important um, to address sort of, you know, perceive, the perceived risk piece, um, but also um, to, to sort of put in the base of, of how people are thinking about this. Um, and certainly we've seen momentum in the space. I mean, even in the, I would, as an observation, I think, um, over the last 12 months, 18 months, two years, um, we've seen um, in, the, in the, 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 the DFI space, certainly we've seen sort of a much more ramped up sort of commitment in relation to the 2X initiatives um, from OPIC and other DFIs you know, and the, the great work that, that DFAT is also doing, um, which right. is also um, seeing that that, um, that access um, and the attention um, and for institutional markets in relation to this area at scale. Um, and then in the more in sort of the institutional sort of impact space, um, I would observe that um, that even compared to say two years ago, um, some of the products product offerings that we're starting to see um, are increasingly thoughtful in their approach to looking at sort of a gender lens and looking and, and the way that they're looking at impact um, beyond, you know, box ticking and just counting women. And so that's an, an area that we're looking at actively. 
and I think it is an important and it's an encouraging development. Absolutely, and I think we're seeing the same trends as as you are. So it's great to have uh, you know leaders like QBE take take up the reins on these issues, and of course, it's momentum is being built by others such as OPIC in the space. Um, and maybe that's, that's a good um, uh, opportunity for me to invite to wrap this up. Um, you know, having worked with investors in Australia, the United States, and Asia, Rebecca, if you could provide some insights into what are the key elements of, of the bond, uh, the Women's Avia Bond series that you think has made it attractive for investors, um, I think that would be um, a great way to wrap up the discussion. Mm, yeah, thanks, Natasha. So, I mean, I'll, I'll just refer back to Simba's comments earlier, he mentioned what was important was yield diversification um, in the portfolio, risk perceptions versus perceived, and liquidity or a secondary market. And I would say that all of those things contributed to the attractiveness of the WLB1 in the Asian market um, and WLB2 interest that we're getting from um, investors now. So the, the just in terms of risk and um, addressing those perceptions, the WLB1 did make use of a blended capital structure. It received grant funding for design and launch of the bond, and as well as a 50% guarantee from USAID, um, an additional first loss capital tranche, uh, which helps improve the bond's credit rating. Um, we've got the diverse basket of uh, underlying assets across different geographies in the portfolio. And there are a number of different stakeholders that really wanted, want this product to succeed. Um, the, the banks, DBS and ANZ, as mentioned earlier, and a number of non-profit organisations and government agencies. Also want to highlight that um, the integrity that's built into the impact assessment in profiling women's voices and tying investment dollars to those impact investments really um, has built the credibility of this product in the minds of investors and uh, it's not that easy to do that at scale at the given the number of women that we're wanting to impact which is a million million women across Asia um, so we need to we are building a technology platform that will profile the voices of women and um, provide a data-driven approach to impact measurement and then create and build in transparency into the reporting to investors uh, around social outcomes, which creates uh, um, obligations or, uh, I guess, authenticity in, um, in the validity of the impact that we're providing and accountability between investors and us as the product development uh, entity, as well as accountability to enterprises and borrowers to their clients. So we see that as really important and also really valuable for investors. Great, thanks Rebecca. Uh, and thanks everyone for your, for your insights. And, and um, I'm afraid we have run out of time. So I would um, you know, thank you all for, for taking the time to be with us. Uh, and Rebecca, just to make some final remarks on your, your, uh, your overview, of course, I think, uh, this is something that Christy brought up in her uh, comments as well, is that gen gender lens investing and investing in this space. This is a space where there is a lot of impact washing, there's green washing, there's pink washing, there's all sorts of uh, different ways to soften the way we're, we're uh, defining what impact investing is. So even when I hear the $500 billion number, I, I personally always question what that really means. And I think the fact that mo many of us are waking up to the fact that um, when we are looking to empower underserved communities, uh, it is important to have their voice as a part of the process. It's important to make sure that the investment decision-making process looks at power dynamics across the decision-making spectrum, not just at the end results, but really understanding how uh, factors such as gender equality make you make better capital allocation decision uh, decisions as well. And I think the fact that we are now looking to leverage technology to help us do that at scale is, is exciting. Um, I also think there is so much promise um, to do more uh, with Australian investors and, and also with um, organizations coming from within Australia. I think when we were doing the Pacific Rice program, we saw a number of Australian entrepreneurs bringing their uh, product services and businesses to these regions and also serving as both buyers and suppliers to these regions. So I think um, it is an 
integral to have Australia as part of the future sustainable development equation for the entire region. And um, it's been a very, very enriching conversation. So thank you all very much for your insights. And thank you very much to the audience for listening in. And I hope we managed to uh, respond to most of your questions. The recording will be made available as well to everybody. Uh, and um, if you have any further questions for us or any of the other panelists, please do not hesitate to reach out and we'll do our best to get back to you uh, swiftly. Thanks everybody and signing off from Singapore. <laughs>